Welcome to my channel, Journey with Kelleen. Please like, subscribe, and share this video. Please feel free to drop a comment down below. Please do not take anything I say as medical advice. I am not a doctor or do I work in any medical field. I just want to share my journey and my personal experiences. Hopefully, I can inspire or motivate someone out there. In this video, I want to look at the causes and symptoms of hydrocephalus in kids, the risk factors, and some of the complications that are associated with it. As you know, my child was diagnosed with severe congenital hydrocephalus. For those who don't know, hydrocephalus is a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid or CSF in the hollow places inside the brain. Hydrocephalus has a lot of symptoms. In my previous video, I touch on the symptoms. However, in this video, I'm just going to give a refresh of the common signs, the physical signs and symptoms, and the behavioral and cognitive signs. Some of the common signs you'll see in children with hydrocephalus would be changes in the head. An unusual large head, a rapid increase in the size of the head, a bulging or a tense soft spot, Okay, so the physical signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus would include vomiting, sleepiness, poor feeding, deficits in muscle tone and strength, poor growth, unstable balance, even seizures can occur. There are many physical signs or symptoms associated with hydrocephalus. Now on to the behavioral and the cognitive changes. You'll have irritability, you'll have change in personality, decline in school performance. You can even have delays or problems with previously acquired skills such as walking or talking. Matthew sometimes would say a word and then immediately after you would not even remember it. Sometimes months after before he even says the word again. Now we're going to look at the causes of hydrocephalus. Remember guys, hydrocephalus is caused by an imbalance between how much cerebrospinal fluid is produced and how much is absorbed into the bloodstream. Cerebrospinal fluid is salt water that's made inside the ventricles. It flow around the brain and the spinal cord cushioning them. Is this CSF that helps to keep the brain afloat. Technically, it allows our every brain to float within the skull. That's what it does. It takes nutrients to the brain and it also takes away waste from the brain. It is then absorbed into our bloodstream and new or fresh CSF is produced. Excess cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles occurs in one of the following. You have obstruction, poor absorption, and overproduction of this fluid. Let us look at obstruction. The most common problem is a partial obstruction of the normal flow of cerebrospinal fluid, either from one ventricle to another or from the ventricles to other spaces around the brain. Poor absorption. This one is less common. It is a problem with a mechanism that enable the blood vessels to absorb cerebrospinal fluid. This is often related to inflammation of the brain tissues from disease or injury. Last one is overproduction. This one occurs rarely. Basically, cerebrospinal fluid is created more quickly than it can be absorbed. Now let us look at some of the risk factors associated with hydrocephalus. There is no one cause of hydrocephalus. It may be linked to genetics defect or a complication of another disorder. Children may also develop hydrocephalus after birth as a complication. For example, premature birth can lead to hydrocephalus. 
In many cases, the exact event leading to hydrocephalus is unknown. However, a number of developmental or medical problems can contribute or trigger hydrocephalus. Now, if you're wondering who gets hydrocephalus, a child can be born with hydrocephalus. This is known as congenital hydrocephalus. This is the type that my son has. He has severe congenital hydrocephalus. You can get hydrocephalus later in life. This one is called acquired hydrocephalus. And also, hydrocephalus can run in the family, which is where the genetic virgin comes in. Hydrocephalus present at birth or shortly after birth can lead to abnormal development of the central nervous system that can obstruct the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. Bleeding within the ventricles, a possible complication of premature birth. Infection in the uterus during pregnancy such as rubella or syphilis that can cause inflammation in the fetal brain tissues. Others include tumors of the brain or spinal cord, central nervous system infections such as bacterial meningitis, bleeding in the brain from a stroke or head injury or other traumatic injury of the brain. I would like to give you some information about the complications of hydrocephalus. Long-term complications of hydrocephalus can vary widely and are often difficult to predict. If hydrocephalus has progressed by the time of birth, it may result in significant intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities. Less severe cases, when treated appropriately, may have few, if any, serious complications. Now, the severity, though, of the complications, this depends on three things. The underlying medical or developmental problems, the severity of initial symptoms, and three, timeliness of diagnosis and treatment. Hydrocephalus is diagnosed by a doctor. The doctor would ask about the symptoms. They'll do exams. The doctor would also study the images, such as ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI images. Remember now, there is no one cause of hydrocephalus. It can happen at any stage or age of life. Hydrocephalus occurs more frequently among infants and adults 60 and over. Hydrocephalus can be treated by using a shunt or surgery known as ETV. In my next video, I will explain more about the treatment and surgery for hydrocephalus. Thank you guys for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please like, subscribe, and share my content.